Hey folks, it's Ray with Taste Radio. Right now, I'm honored to be speaking with Leslie Carl Saltarelli, Nick Saltarelli, and Jake Carls, the co-founders of Midday Squares. Thank you so much yep. for being with me today. Thanks for having us, Ray. This is awesome. We're super pumped to be here. Yeah, I'm a as fan I was saying. Of the show, so it's a fanboy moment for me. <laughs> I well, want to fire the engines up today. That's what's going to happen. <laughs> You know, I, I'm the, the feelings are all mutual here because, uh, you know, your brand is is just a remarkable one. And hearing your voices after seeing you uh, in so many social moments, uh, this is like a real, this is like a weird IRL moment for me, but a really cool one. So, you know, as I mentioned, you know, social is a huge part of what you guys do. And, and one of the things that I first uh, encountered when learning about Midday Squares your Instagram content, I could I could look at that for days. It's pretty much the most entertaining content that I've seen. And I don't want to qualify it as, as like seeing a food or beverage company do, but like just any company do. It's really, really good. And then the, the one post that really stuck out to me recently was the one where you celebrated making 250,000 bars in a single month. Okay. First of all, I need viewers to describe this because I'm not going to do it justice. And whose idea was this? Leslie, was this your idea? Because you were pretty heavily featured in that post. <laughs> yeah, so um, that was it, was, it was definitely my idea. I don't know if you saw the behind the scenes of that video. No. But I, I was in a garbage bag, okay, <laughs> with nothing on underneath. Everything was sticking to me. It was a mess, okay? There was chocolate everywhere. But yeah, that video was great. Social media is a big thing for us at Midday Squares. And storytelling, you know, is what we're, we're really known for and telling the story of entrepreneurship. Um, I appreciate you loving our content and, and, and making that statement because we do put a lot of effort into telling the story um, and putting out value added content that really makes people feel something deeply. That is, you know, our saying around here is whatever we're going to put out, let's make sure it makes people feel something deeply. Yeah, well, it made me feel something for sure. And, and that's how far you guys are willing to go to produce really good content, really entertaining content. Um, you know, Nick, uh, you told me that we show everything to our audience. And then I, uh, just to follow up on that, I saw a post that said uh, transparency is Midday Square's currency. And you talked a lot about why and the reasons behind why you show everything behind the scene. It's basically, you know, you're willing to show everything that goes on the co in the company uh, in a way that I think might throw some people off because a lot of times, you know, I've, I've been exposed on the podcast. People only want to tell you the good stuff and you guys show everything, the good, the bad, the ugly, et cetera. Why is currency, why is transparency so important to you, Nick? If you go back to like what makes us love brands, we had to just ask ourselves the question. I remember when we got started, I asked myself why I feel for certain brands and it usually comes down to a connection that I would feel with the founder. Like that's like the number one piece uh, that, that we believe in. And so when you look at like celebrity of the world that I think we have such a new age celebrity, um, it's not even about actors or singers anymore. It's really about content creators in general. And that comes in all shapes and forms. Um, it's, we become obsessed not in a bad way, but in, in their lives. We want to feel what they're going through. And so when we went to the grocery store and we walked the aisles and we're looking at like, how are we going to drive a connection in a day and age where like we can't compete on much other than creativity, ingenuity, great product. But at the end of the day, the only thing that is defensive for us is to build a relationship with an audience that's so deep that when they buy Midday Squares, they don't feel like they're just buying Midday Squares. They feel like they're buying a product from the entrepreneur that they want to be part of their lives, their friend, someone that they aspire to be or not, um, that they've been on the journey with us and that they're really buying from a friend, neighbor, or any of that. And, and how do you do that? I think, you know, when you look at like psychology, the best way to have meaningful relationships is this entirety of being truthfully who we are with people and that means letting down the guard of who we're trying to portray ourselves to be and so you know jake said it perfectly is we, if we're going to allow them to be on the journey then we have to allow that everybody to feel what we go through and the only way to let them feel what we go through is to show it in entirety and unfortunately that means the negative as well too sometimes um, and that's really where we've based our our entire 
um, you know, content strategy is around the curtain being lifted at all times. And that's where the reality television show component comes into. It's relatability. Um, creating relatability is so important for the customers to feel connected to us because they can relate to Jake, Nick, and I. Like Nick said, we're not trying to be somebody else on social media. So the transparency is relatable. When Nick and I are having a fight as husband and wife, that's relatable. When Jake and I are having an argument, that's relatable, brother, sister, right? So you, it's the relatability that I think people are so connected to um, and that they don't feel like they're just... They don't know where they're buying a product from, that it's some company, you know, it's just another product on the shelf. They know exactly who they're buying the product from. And we are all, we are all very different characters. So they each cling on to different things about the MDS crew, you know? Yeah. And to, and to add where that all came from, I think it's super important. We missed it on it is it came from data. Actually, the data approach was Shark Tank was on a tear. Shark Tank, the show is on an absolute tear in the in the later 2010s. And the reason why was they were making mass, the mass attractive to entrepreneurship. Even though it was very surface level, it was very attractive and fascinating for the consumer to watch entrepreneurs on their journey in quotations to getting somewhere, raising money, seeing the failures, successes, but it really was too surface level. So when we started, I said to Leslie and Nick, I was like, guys, Let's use that fascination and celebritization of entrepreneurs and let's take advantage of that by showing the behind the scene, the glass door of the company, seeing everything that's been happening to allow them to feel the feelings. But at the same time, I said, we need to build our characters. We need to build the three characters up so that we can turn ourselves into more of a boy girl band, kind of like what the 90s, like Spice Girl did, you know, NSYNC, Backstreet Boys, all these great bands. What the cool part about bands is, is that you can at least relate, like Leslie said, to one member. And that's super important because if you can relate to one member, you have that emotional connection. And that emotional connection is hard to buy in today's world. You can't purchase it. You need to be able to actually connect. And connectivity is so hard. Physical, real connectivity is very difficult. And in a world where attention is obviously the key or the transparency or the, the key to success, that's one way to break the attention barrier that's that's a fatigue in the world currently. And I think we've 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 made it a, a priority and a mandate to continue this on forever as long as this business exists, because we create a tribe through it. And tribalism is the future of, in my opinion, of CPG. On the one hand, you have these rock star boy girl band personalities these these outward characters that you present to the public but then internally i wonder how it works from a business perspective when you are managing a fast growing brand how do you find balance for me at least i think we all talk about this differently um i'm an extroverted heart um i'm always up and about i've been that guy my whole life where I, I i energize the people the crowd the friend group um but i broke down um during this this two and a half, half year journey because i i thought my switch always had to be on um in terms of being that energizer bunny that that hype man that i like to call myself um and i finally caved i think it was june 2020 I literally just broke down to my lowest point because I realized that I can't be on all the time. You just can't. It's impossible. The body can't take it. And I completely hit rock bottom and had to recover. And my business therapist, well, we have a business therapist, all three of us, he helped me get back on my feet. And, you know, showing those vulnerabilities allow the consumer to see the real side of life. And the real side of life is what makes people, again, back to relatability. It relates. It's what's actually happening. And I think you know, we as a whole, speaking for all of us, is we know that the vulnerability is the truth and the truth needs to always come out. And that's authenticity in terms of buzzword, but from a real angle and not using it as a buzzword. I want to speak for the introverts of the world because that's that is what I am. Um, and uh, I, I'm the type of person when I go into a room full of people, my first instinct is I want to leave. I, I don't feel comfortable amongst a lot of people. I like being in the nature. I like being in the forest. I have no problem communicating. And once I break out and I'm enjoying it, the extrovert of me comes in, but I'm always fighting against my instinct, right? My instinct is I'm, an, I'm, a, I'm a lone wolf. Like it, Les and I like to call each other lone wolves that found each other. Um, and so 
what's been super liberating that I would have never thought is by showing everything truthfully, the exhaustion actually isn't there because the world is seeing the truth. And I don't have to live two lives. I think where the dangerous danger comes in is when you're portraying one thing and living another thing. It becomes exhausting because you're constantly going in and out of character. But when you're showing the crying, like you said, or the uh, marriage therapy that my wife and I have gone through and during certain rocky uh, parts of this journey, then I know the audience knows everything. I don't have to show up anywhere and pretend like my life doesn't have struggles. I don't have to show up and pretend like everything's rosy. People know, they actively know what's going on. And it's very liberating that I find the more the liberation comes, the less I feel trapped. And so it's been counterintuitive for me, to be honest. I was very reserved before we got into the idea of showing everything. It was really Jake that pushed us to do so. And now that we've done it, it's actually very liberating. I think for me, um, I agree with what Jake and Nick are saying, but I think when it comes to the managing of media and running a company, that is very hard. Like to give you an example, Ray, you know, we will like our weeks are filled with, like you said, the tediousness of running this company, scaling and dealing with a, being a manufacturer, a wholesaler and a brand. And then on top of that, we've got this media component. So it's like multiple times a day we're pulled out of what we're doing. So there's a lot of context switching to have to go, you know, make a TikTok or uh, do a, a video or maybe right after work, go to a recording studio or on the weekends do ads. We are the people in these videos, right? So on top of the normal workload and stress, we, we have to be able to context switch uh, religiously um, and go from a state of business, potential stress or potential problem solving to, okay, show up for the camera now. And so there is, it is very challenging keeping up with the content um, and still um, scaling this business right now. Um, but from like a, an emotional standpoint, I agree with Nick, once you are fully yourself on the camera, the crying, the the highs, the lows, you don't even think about it. It's more the management of keeping up with content and good content and still running a business. Who's your content producer? Do you have one or are all three of you involved in what you want to show? And I'm, I mean, what you want to show sounds like it's everything. So I guess who decides what gets posted and what doesn't? Yeah, so the way the team works right now, we've, we've got an in-house editor. We've got an in-house videographer. We have a showrunner and then myself. So basically, uh, we formulate ideas. We see what's on, on tap on people's calendars for the week. And then we have a big media meeting at the beginning of the week to identify, okay, what are the... So we have multiple different types of stories, right? We've got documentary type stories. So long-term things we can't show today, like trade secrets, uh, any lawsuits, any type of stuff that can't be shown to the public at the current moment uh, due to, like I said, trade secrets. And then we've got, you know, daily news stories. So stuff that's happening on the daily, which is usually stuff that we'll see through people's calendars. And then we've got actual series storytelling. So stuff where you'll see like an IGTV um, a type of type of stuff. And then we've got keeping up with staying relevant to pop culture, which is like TikToks and trendier things. So, and then we have, uh, again, LinkedIn, where Jake will actually repurpose the content we make to speak to the industry. And then we have our podcast, which Nick and Kara, our showrunner, um, work every two weeks to build out a show. So there's a lot of moving parts to the media and how we do it. Um, it takes a village and uh, there's many different types of storytelling we have. But yes, that's our current team and how we process ideas. And once the team kind of produces the content, I'll go through and say, you know, it's approved or not approved, or let's, you know, re-edit something. I believe that if it's not fuck yeah, then it's no. And if it doesn't make me feel something when I'm watching it, it's cut. That's how we we run the, the media department. So I just want to add, I think I think a lot of people mix us up at the time. They're like, are you a media company or are you a chocolate company or are you a chocolate manufacturer that creates media? It's actually that we're both. And that's what makes it so hot, in my opinion, is that it's so different, you know, that you don't see the food CPG world. And I think, Ray, you said at the beginning, you don't want to classify us as seeing anything from a food or beverage standpoint. It's an overall standpoint, because Leslie and the content team cross-pollinates 
so many different industries together. The boy girl band approach comes from the musician industry, but then packaging, branding, storytelling comes from everything, not just the food and beverage. And I think that's what makes it really special within this industry. I think what's what's cool, Ray, and what you touched on at the beginning is you're right. I, and I'm not saying this to boast. I'm saying the content that Midday Square has put out, I generally watch as a viewer. And it's just good content. I think in a, a day, in a day and age where we're flooded with content, what's happened is people are trying to play the algorithm game. So if somebody's getting traction, you know, an influencer is getting traction on this type of content, people want to replicate it. And so we're starting to live in a world where there's not good, fresh new content. It's a lot of repetitive content. So I do feel Midday Square is a breath of fresh air of what you could find when it comes to social media. Absolutely. I mean, I certainly feel that way in terms of the content overload that we see. And you're always looking for something that's different, that's entertaining, that's something that you, you want to come back to, to see something that's different and entertaining. I guess the question that some entrepreneurs listening might have is, well, if I invest a lot of resources, time and money into this content strategy, what am I getting out of it? What's my return on investment? Do you have a measurable way? Do you have a way to measure that kind of uh, return? So there's two, there's two things that I, I really, I'm part of um, like a mastermind where I sit a lot with big D to C companies, uh, brands that, you know, that we all know flow high, uh, uh, sorry, flow hydrant, Anyway, we can go on on those stuff. But the, the point is I sit with a bunch of, uh, of these people and we speak about this all the time. I think the biggest confusion is that everybody's looking for attribution, attribution, attribution. That's fine, you know, in a world of where a click equates to revenue. But then there's this overarching idea of what tribalism means and value. What we did is we kind of took, we went on the New York Stock Exchange and the NASDAQ and we took out all the companies that are in the food space that are food manufacturers. And then we took out all the companies that we felt had tribalism built into their companies. Um, and one of the main fascinations is that when you do the split, everybody that didn't have tribalism built in, how we define tribalism is, was the brand capable of hosting events that people would show up to in mass to be part of that brand's event? So Nike has a running club, Red Bull has you know so much of their activity, Lululemon Live Yoga, how, like how much were the consumers willing to be part of the community that they put together versus just the brand, right? Because there's two different style brands. When we looked at the multiples at which the companies that traded that didn't have tribalism built into it, they all traded at about one to two times revenues. The second we went into tribalistic brands, it started at seven and went all the way up to 22 times revenues. So what's fascinating about that is that it's counterintuitive because it costs more up front, but every dollar that you do in revenue while actually having tribalism built into your, your, your brand is worth three and a half up to 10 times more than the revenue that you would generate without that, based on if we look at the multiples in the public market. And we felt that. I mean, by putting out the content, our network between how we've ended up in celebrities' homes, investors' homes. Um, it's The content has closed our Series A and Series B. We've never really had to put much energy into that piece because by definition, the audience has gotten so big that everybody knows somebody in the audience that's able to help us. And then on a final note, not just looking at the multiples, is that there's also a huge ROI in solving problems. And we spoke about this in the in the pre-show, Ray, when we were just discussing. It was uh, last summer we had a, a coconut sugar problem, and there was a mass shortage of powdered coconut sugar on the market. We could not get it. The lead times were like three months, um, and basically we were faced with an issue that we couldn't make our chocolate the way we wanted it to. Nobody was willing to do. We were calling up other chocolate manufacturers, and they're like, "Guys, we're booked. We can't. Even if you wanted to, we can't get you in to help you. Even if we wanted to help you." So the moment came where we sat down at the table and we're like, "Okay, we might have to not do production for like two months." And then we were all. It was like clockwork. We all looked at each other and we're like, "Yo, let's get on the gram." And so we went to the. You know, we went on Instagram. We posted a story to our audience, being like, "Guys, we're in this together." 
like you guys, we, we, we're transparent. We're in this together. So we're going to ask you for your help. We got a coconut problem. Here's the problem. Here's X, Y, and Z. In 24 hours, we had people sourcing for us. We, and then this, this girl out of Toronto calls and is basically, hey, my dad's got a factory full of re, uh, machinery that he buys, used, and, and repurposes and sells them. He's got this one machine that's capable of turning the coconut powder, uh, sorry, coconut sugar into coconut powder. So at that time in the market, we were able to buy coconut sugar, the granular stuff, not the powder. She's like, if you guys pay for uh, shipping, we'll send it to you for free. Use the machine when you're done with it, send it back. In 24 hours, this machine shows up at our warehouse. We use it. We convert our coconut sugar to powder and boom, problem solved. That simply would not be possible without the audience. Therefore, we wouldn't have the audience without the content and we wouldn't have the content without the team and investment made into that. And these are the things I show up on our board meetings to explain to our investor base of the importance of why the investment needs to be here today in these areas. So the ROI is maybe more tricky to calculate. It's not, we spend a dollar, we get $6 back, but the ROI is there. And I think our investor base, us, our team, have all come to understand how important the community has been that's been built around this content. Just to add in on the community, a big one for any food and beverage company out there is uh, one of the biggest natural retailers in Canada, and they're actually, I think, the biggest in North America, actually. We got that account from our community. They opened the door for us um, to multiple retailers um, of sizes anywhere from 10 stores to 500 um, in terms of that. And just that's the truth behind creating the content. That's the return on investment is is those relationships end up going so far. Half our investment and investors come from the community introducing us to them, right? Or sending cold emails that end up coming back to us. So I think it's a it's an ecosystem. If you don't have the entire ecosystem, and I think you can't just say content, I think what's important is you have to have also a product that fits the market. Without that, the whole thing doesn't work. So you need the both sides pumping at the same time in growth like that. This is blowing my mind. I mean, you know, we're definitely not talking about traditional metrics when we're talking about return on investment. But Nick is saying that our Series A and Series B was closed via our content or hearing that, uh, you know, you're using your community as your industry network. I mean, these, this is incredible. But you, you both, you know, nailed it when you talked about the product. The product is so important. And let's back up a second and talk about where this idea for Midday Squares came from. Leslie, I believe it was your idea for the brand, um, and you had been involved in entrepreneurship. You would have been an entrepreneur for many years prior to this. How did you land on a food business? Because I don't think you were in the food business prior to Midday Squares. Exactly. So I have been a foodie my entire life. I love food. I cook in the kitchen all the time. I actually at one point wanted to become a chef. Um, I had gone down to the Cordon Bleu and um, in, before I invested in that, I actually went to go work in a couple of restaurants. Um, so I, I had, I always had the love for food. Um, I veered off into fashion at, at, at a point and then that company didn't work. Um, but everyone always says, oh, Midday Squares is so successful. Well, that's 10 years in the making. I've been an entrepreneur for 10 years in my life. I've swung and missed a million times. Um, but I took all those learnings and I really put them into midday squares. You know, even with my clothing line, I was always behind the scenes and I didn't design a product for me. I'm short and curvy. I designed a product for like a tall, thin model. I couldn't even wear my own clothes. Like, how does that make sense? Right. And then on top of that, I wasn't even on social media telling the story of when I'm, you know, schlepping, you know, 20 pound collections over my back, going store to door, door to door in New York city. You know, that's the story that people want to see and be part of. And so I took all those learnings and brought them over to midday square as so did Jake and Nick. Um, and when I was kind of on a down period of figuring out what was next, but I actually had made this product like a very um, simple version of what it is today while I was living with Nick and working on fashion um, because Nick was always eating like 
crappy foods in the afternoon. So he was like a big, you know, a kick out, oh, Henry, like you name it kind of guy. Um, and we lived with each other as roommates at this point. Like Nick and I were roomies. He invested in my clothing company. I was giving it one more shot. Um, and so I said, let me make you something that's going to be better for you. Won't I can't promise you that it's going to be just as good, but I can promise you it will be better. And I made him a version of the midday squares and fast forward a couple years later, um, you know, we, I closed my company. I was kind of figuring out what was next. Nick sold his shares in his software company. He was figuring out what was next. And we knew we had worked well together because he invested in my clothing company. So, oh, and at this point we were engaged and we were already dating. Like we, we, we moved in as friends and it only lasted a couple of months. Um, and then we decided right before we got married and that we were going to to commercialize this product that I made Nick. And, and it was also based off of some data that that rolled through um, uh, Nick, that, that Nick had come upon. And, and that's how it all really happened. So once I had, you know, the basis of the product, we knew we needed to commercialize it in a way that made sense for the market. And so we did a lot of market research. And I'll kind of let Nick get in from there of, of, of how we, we took it to market. Before you answer, Nick, I, I just want to interrupt for a second and, and let Leslie know that I also had that, you know, midday issue with, uh, you know, candy bars and whatnot and Reese's peanut butter cups. Oh. And uh, man, you know, when I heard that midday squares is like a Reese's peanut butter cup on yeah. steroids, I'm like, oh my gosh, how did no one think of that this ever before? This is incredible. <laughs> That's the whole thing, right? Midday, no one gives love to midday. Right. Yeah. Yeah, no, it was, there was so much fascinating data. What's really funny was how not obvious this whole thing was to Les and I at the time. Uh, we were actually working on an entirely different food business. We were trying to get into the oats business, uh, the morning oats segment, because I still love hot water on just old school oats. Uh, but we couldn't find any interesting there. But what was interesting was that this product that Les had made had, a, like people would call or be like, yo, could you get me some of those squares? As if it was like, you know, like a, like a black market transaction. You know? <laughs> and, um, so that always fascinated me. And then I, I got this report from someone super high up at a big CPG company that uh, leads their M&A. And I, he, he was pushing me for probably four years to get into the business. Um, I, I grew up in the food business. My dad was a wicked food entrepreneur before he passed away. He died when I was 10. Um, so ultimately, you know, my family comes from a lot of, food importing, food distribution, my Italian immigrants. I'm a, I'm a child of Italian immigrants. So it was always part of my core. But when I got into software, I really left that whole area. Um, and so he was pushing me to get into it. And I read this report that was super fascinating. It was really showing the impact and growth of the real chocolate industry. And then it was talking about the plant-based protein industry. The, the plant-based protein industry, I think, has been obvious for a while in the media what was really interesting was that real chocolate report of how fast real chocolate was growing. And the definition of real chocolate is it can't use any cocoa, non-cocoa derivative in its product. So it has to either have cocoa butter, cocoa, or and sugar, or if anything else is in there, like palm kernel oil, uh, any other fat that is not from derived from cocoa, it cannot be considered the real chocolate. So I'm reading this report and I'm like, Okay, okay, okay. And the one main thing that was very similar in all of the brands that were exploding in the real chocolate was they had one characteristic that was the same. They all looked like a traditional chocolate bar. Rectangle, thick. When you bite into it, there's like a, a snap. It's got an incredible mouth experience. And when we looked at what was going on in the plant-based market, it looked like somebody had created a plant-based chocolate bar, but it, it wasn't true. When you went to go look at the chocolate that was being used in all the plant-based protein bars, uh, it was these small little crappy millimeter um, chocolate and robings, nothing against them. I'm just saying in terms of experience in the mouth, um, it was missing that like chocolate bar experience. It wasn't even, it's not really tempered that it's, you know, it's, it's, it's yeah. not real chocolate. I mean, it's, it. It, the, the palm kernel oil bases is what allow it to be manufactured on mass. And it was like, Oh, this light bulb <laughs> in my brain. Like, Oh my God. If we, Les is already making a baby of these two categories. Like this is the thing. 
And, and I pitched her that morning, literally we were having eggs and I pitched her like, this is, this is it. This is the thing we're doing. And she looked at me and she's like, yeah, I think that is it. Um, and then we spent 2017 to 2018 developing what the market knows today as midday square fudge. Yeah. And, um, yeah, leading up to, to launch, we needed a hype man. And, and, and that's where Jake came in. I saw Jake for two years, the again, rainmaker, the rainmaker. I saw him for two years doing magic with this clothing company called Chase and Hunter. And again, this goes back to Midday Squares is 10 years in the making. Combined between us three, there's got to be, I don't know, like eight to 12 entrepreneurial swings in there of misses. And I see Jake with this clothing company that it really is nothing other than a movement of like college people getting pumped about this brand called Chase and Hunter. And the way it went from a small little idea that Jake was playing with to how he infiltrated like celebrities from Game of Thrones were wearing it, singers, rappers, he half the NFL, he got flown out to an NFL training camp to do a pump up speech. Like I'm watching this on the sidelines. And I'm like, what the hell is going on over here? And we need this, you know, and, and it took me three months. Uh, Jake, I'll let you tell that. It took me yeah. three months to convince Jake to join this well, company. Well, Ray, here's the thing. It's like, for me, I looked at them. I'm like, I love them as entrepreneurs, like my sister and my brother-in-law. But I was like, you know, like chocolate, protein, these are the most saturated spaces. I, I'm a right. workout buff. I used to eat all the protein bars. I used to get dizzy going to this store and looking at the, the massive wall or, or, or aisle full of them. So I said to them, you know what? I'm not really down to be part of that. I love you guys, but it's just, you're going to have a hard time, like a really hard time. And Nick was telling me, we're going to sell $250,000 worth of it in the first year. And I'm thinking to him, I'm thinking in my head, like, this guy's out of his mind. If you think that I'm like, I love the product, but I'm like, you can't compete against these giants that own the space. They pay for the space. They dominate the grocery store. And anyways, after three months, I finally said yes, literally saying no every day. I finally caved and um, I just said to them, I said, guys, it's very simple. We got to take advantage of the hype that's on Shark Tank right now, like we discussed earlier about the hype of building community and celebritizing entrepreneurship. And let's just film everything. Nah, and nah, that was Jake, Jake, you tell the truth. I had to take him on a walk inside. <laughs> of the cemetery. I had to take him on a walk inside of a cemetery. What? Where, <laughs> yes. The reason why we can get into why I like walking and running in cemeteries another time, but the most, oh, the most yeah, no, no, it's actually a very beautiful thing. It, it's allowed my relationship with death to be beautiful. Um, okay. but Jake's grandfather was the greatest salesman of all time. It's literally on his tombstone says the greatest salesman of all time. And we all, his name was up. We all grew to love him. Um, I'm, I'm pumped that I got to meet him. And I'm like, I got to take Jake on a walk to see Bazook because he needs to see where he comes from. And this is what this company needs. And so I walk him to the grave. I'm just like, man, you're Bazook in the making. Like we, you, if you want to pay homage to this man, you need to come help us build this company. And, um, and, and that's, we, I, I thought it was a beautiful moment because that's, that's when it all went down. We kind of, it was like, it was on from that day. on, It was on. Nick, the truth is, is that was the pushing fact. That was a cherry on top. Previous to that, Ray, um, I don't know if you've ever been through this. I don't wish it upon anyone, but it was a life-changing moment in my life. I, I got canned. Uh, the word canned meaning I got dumped, I guess, is a way to put it. After Fired. Four, yeah, f- fired from a relationship after four years out of nowhere. So I was kind of in this phase of my mind where I was just like, I don't know where I am. I don't know what I'm doing, but Nick and Leslie helped me find what I was really good at. The strength I had for my previous businesses and just who I am as an individual, I need to be surrounded by community and do community. And that moment was a triggering moment. I'll never forget it in my life because I found what I love. And that inflection point leads to when you do what you love to do and you are true to yourself, like it comes back full circle to our conversation at the beginning, you thrive, you thrive. And I think that's, that's the beauty of, of trial experimentation and also working with people, not because they're family, but working because they are the right partners to work with. Like Leslie, Nick, and I have all different skill set that don't touch upon each other at all. And that's a super important point is people always say, oh, your family business. Yes, we are a, we are family, but we didn't go into business because we're family. We went into business because we complement each other's skill sets. 
Yeah, for sure. Well, Jake, I, I wonder if uh, how many times that uh, Nick was asking you to join the company that you were like, you know, on the side telling Leslie, hey, hey this guy is going to, you know, all your life savings are going to be gone. Watch out for this guy. I don't know if this is such a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but, but it turns out you had the right people. Clearly, you had the right product. The name is so important. The name and the branding is so important. We already identified why it's midday. Um, why squares? It was really uh, counterintuitive. People, when we were doing testing, we were doing them in smaller serving sizes because we didn't want to use a full bar. What became very interesting, and this is where feedback from early consumers is so important, is that everybody loved that they were small squares because they would have them at different points in the day. And I was like, again, it was like, poosh, brain explode. <laughs> oh my God, we give them two squares instead of one long bar. And at the end of the day, that really doubles down on the value that's driven in our pack. Like it's two squares and you get to eat them at two entirely different uh, times should you choose or in one shot. And it really breaks down the idea that, you know, like midday squares is just different. It's, 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 it's the blue ocean strategy. When everybody's a rectangle, be a square. And when everybody's a square, be a circle. First, you need something that attracts the customer's eye in the aisles of that, you know, where your product's surrounded by 35,000 plus products. You know, then it's got to taste good once they open it. And then it's got to mean something in 2021, in my opinion, which is a tribalism for us. Um, and I think that the whole idea of the square and and having you know one and then another one whenever you want is like Nick said it was it was early on what the customers wanted. Now we're even going to the point where hopefully in 2022 or 2023 we're going to have packaging that really allows you to eat one square at a time and save the other one without having to keep the open package. So we just continue to listen to the customers. And I think that's the other beautiful thing about social media is in 2021, and I think it's been like this for the last you know decade or so, um, we are able to have live data from our customers. Um, you know, we go on the ground, we ask them a question, they want to be able to eat two squares, but they want to be able to resell their package. So that's what we're working on now, right? So it's so amazing to have that connection. Yeah, and I think from the name, you got to bring back, Nick, I don't think you mentioned it, is, you know, you were inspired by five-hour energy, not necessarily the product, but you knew when you had five-hour energy, everyone knows what that is, you're getting your five hours of energy. Midday squares, you're literally, you know, we, we like this as an afternoon snack that's square formatted. So in the brain, we wanted it to be easily processed, right? And I think that's a big thing too, because there's some companies that name the products that you can't even, it doesn't make sense in the brain. And there's a disconnect and that disconnect can hurt the experience tremendously for re-explanation of the product, for sharing the product, for telling someone about it. You know, I'll ne I never forget, I read a book that talked about, you want to make it as easy as possible for someone to explain to a friend, a family member at the dinner table, what they just had or what they just went through. And uh, midday squares was easy. You eat at midday and it's squares. Creating that trust with your customers and actually doing what you say you're going to do. So, you know, like when we say it's, you know, peanut butter, chocolate peanut butter, we are, we are delivering on that. When we say fudge, yeah, we're delivering on fudge. When we say almond crunch, we're delivering on almond crunch. I think it's important, even with our name, is that whatever you say you're doing, whatever's on that package needs to be true so the customer can trust the brand. I want to ask about midday, though, the midday part, because it is straightforward. It is very intuitive when you're supposed to eat this product or when it is uh, maybe most impactful in your day in, in terms of a snack. But it might seem to folks in the industry that it's limiting in terms of use education, daily day part use. Have you seen that? I mean, has that has there have there been people who are like, okay, well, you know, I, I'd rather, you know, I, I don't understand this product because it's like I don't really snack in the middle of the day, or you know, is it is it something where you know your customers just look at it as okay, it's called midday, but I have it any time of the day. So, again, I want to drive home how important data is. I was getting ready. I was tired of entrepreneurship. I really was. Les, Les convinced me into this journey, really convinced me into it. I was, I was interviewing to go work for another company. And we were, it was a food company, a food delivery service, a really big one um, in Canada. And we were, I was at a, I was fortunate enough uh, to be in a 
executive meeting where they were presenting the data behind breakfast and afternoon. And this was fascinating was that the afternoon market is nearly as big as the breakfast market. We're talking a delta of like five, 10%. It's really not that big of a split, but yet everybody is on that breakfast train, like you know, fast food. What's the next breakfast? Uh, how to make your breakfast easier in D2C. Everybody was on that train. And there was this afternoon segment that's like massive. And so I remember early on, you know, conversations with different investors. Yeah, we were scrutinized, like this name's limiting. Now we have a trick in our back sleeve in the future for that. Um, but at the end of the day, it's like, let's get to a hundred million of revenue in the afternoon segment. And, and we'll worry about what's next then, you know, like, let's just get to a hundred first because it's big enough to be able to do that. Um, and, and then to answer the question to our consumers, yeah, our consumers, they don't care. They eat it whenever the hell they want. You know, like a lot of them, uh, a lot of our guests have it in for breakfast. A lot of our guests have it in the afternoon and night, night indulgence with their coffee. But yeah, I think we just want it to be a healthy nudge into that afternoon segment. But in no means, I think, are we trying to build a company around afternoon? Um, I think we're just trying to build an epic company around snacking. And that usually happens in the afternoon. Well, there's another epic company that I think of when I think of Midday Squares, and that's Supreme. Because your logo and their logo, I think, use the same font. Was that intentional? Yeah. So it, it's. I always go for the record. Les, I'll let you take it home. But it's not the same font. We actually went with Instagram's font. It's this lobster uh, font that happens to also be similar to Supreme. But we did it for the Instagram reason of relatability. But yes, it is definitely there. And the inspiration is definitely there. Uh, Les, take it away. So I think when we started, um, you know, Nick and like when it, when it was just Nick and I, before we brought Jake on, we wanted to, you know, have an idea of what this looked like. Again, it goes back to the, you know, the whole relatability and the whole, you know, the market is used to seeing that font. They understand it. They love it. It's it's something that's been, you know, commercialized. Um, so it's really easy on the eyes, which is cool. Um, so right away, you kind of look at it and you're like, oh, that looks familiar, right? There's a familiar familiar familiarity around it which um which created all like right off the bat um attract like attraction right so there wasn't too much thought that went into designing the packs and the the stuff at the time our main goal is let's get a product that looks good that feels good that speaks to us um brand wise out into the world asap i think you can spend a very long time on brand. Brand is so important. Um, but if you spend so much time, I know a lot of people that do this where they're, you know, waiting for the perfect website, the perfect card, the perfect look, um, and that actually delays them from starting. And so for us, we went with what was familiar to us as well, what we liked visually. Nick, I, and Jake are super into fashion. We're super into pop culture. So uh, that was what spoke to us. Um, and we have some exciting things in the works uh, for a redesign, rebrand, uh, which I'm super pumped about. I can't say when it's going to be released, but we're really starting to hone in on what Midday Squares is. Um, and so we have something really exciting that's launching uh, in the second half of 2021. Very cool. Very excited to see what that looks like. Um, one thing I didn't ask about, and this is a really important part of your business, is the fact that Midday Squares is a refrigerated bar brand. This is something where, you know, in, in today's market, you're seeing a lot of refrigerated snacks. That segment is growing very quickly. When you launch, that wasn't necessarily the case, and particularly in, in Canada. I think I saw an Instagram post where you were the only uh, snack bar in the refrigerated set next to like, you know, yogurt and, and uh, Tropicana orange juice. So, <laughs> I mean, I, I wonder why you went down that road when it didn't seem like the easiest path. Canada has yet to place the refrigerated snacking set um, in their retailers. Um, this can be dominated by it's three monopolies that have most of the groceries games. So they don't know where to put the product. So what they do is they typically put it, like you said, next to Tropic Canada eggs or milk, which affects the whole experience of midday squares because we are an impulse discovery item. And if you look at the US, um, where you are, Ray, you know, there's been a set carved by an amazing company called Perfect Bar, Perfect Snacks. They've done a phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal job in, in pioneering what we're doing in Canada, actually, 
they did all that legwork and digging for the last 13 years, or maybe correct me if I'm wrong after, but maybe longer. And they built a gorgeous set that actually has a real destination for refrigerated snacking. Now, what's beautiful about the set is it's not saturated. It might be saturated with a lot of Me Too products that either copied, you know, Perfect Bar or similar like style products. But when now we're pitching to the buyers in the US, they're they're really enjoying this concept because they're like finally an innovation within the set from the last 13 years. Perfect Bar innovated with the first original bar. We innovate on functional chocolate, you know, meaning you take the chocolate bar, you take a protein bar, which Perfect Bar is a protein bar. You have another chocolate bar in the fridge. We made the baby. So we created that hybrid innovation, which allows for something refreshing within a set that's been continuously, continually growing. We give it a chance to grow even more. Now in Canada, we're fighting the fight, but the fight is very difficult. I've even tried with our team here, our sales team to pitch produce section where the fruits and vegetables are, where they're cut up because that's impulsivity. There's discovery, there's premium products, and they're just not willing to budge. So until, you know, until we continue to actually tell the buyers to bring in more American brands, I don't think we're going to have that destination here in Canada. And we're super excited about our U.S. expansion for that reason um, of having that destination finally. A woman who I uh, really respect spent 15 years at Mars Company. And she, uh, we, we won't name her name because I don't want to put her in any jeopardy. But she basically uh, said, Nick, if you guys go and compete with Hershey's, Mondelez, Mars Company in what their expertise is, which is non-refrigerated, long shelf life, uh, traditional chocolate sets, you're, not, you're never going to beat them at that expertise. They've been doing it for nearly 100 years now. But what they don't understand is short chain, short shelf life, cold chain solutions. They don't understand refrigerated snacking, where it's going. The numbers indicate that it's, it's really the future because it allows for you to bring so much more creativity to the product lines uh, moving forward that are coming out. And, and that is like, if you're going to go and be an upstart, it reminds me a lot of what they say in old school boxing. When you're going to try to grab the belt, you have to fight for the knockout. You cannot fight playing defense. And so if we're going to go for it, we might as well go for it completely. We might as well go after a category that's hard, that's different, that's new, that has all these challenges. Because if we do win, I mean, we have an expertise that our competitors with large amount of money just don't, you know, like they don't, they don't have it. It's not their expertise. Um, and that, that for me was, yeah, it's like, it goes back to that blue ocean strategy. If you're going to sell vitamin water, don't go put it next, don't go put it next to the juices, put it next to the water bottles. I think also the, the great thing too, about the product is, um, and I don't know if I missed this at the beginning, Jake is we don't have preservatives in our product. So the fridge is our preservative. And like Nick mentioned, the, that's where the world is going. They want fresh foods, better for you, functional foods. And what can sit on a shelf for 12 months, people are moving away from. People want stuff that they that, that honestly expires. Um, so yes, it is a little harder from a logistics supply chain, um, you know, distribution standpoint. We, like Jake said, it's it's more open in the US. Canada, we're kind of breaking those barriers, but that's where the world is going. And so our preservative is the refrigerator. Um, and that's, yeah, that's a little bit about why we refrigerate it. One, one super important thing is everybody's been talking about this as if produce hasn't existed for the last like 50 years. Mind blowing. Produce, produce does shorter time chain, harder, faster expiries, razor thin margins compared to our part of the industry. It's like, hello, this is not, this isn't new. It's just new for the category. I think, Ray, something to add is we're having a hard time, um, you know, making the customer experience in Canadian mass retail. Right now, we did a survey talking about tribalism and stuff like that and be able to get real life data that Leslie said earlier. We were able to get about 5,000 customers of ours that shop at the food drug mass level in Canada. And 70% can't find the product in the store when they go there. That's a huge opportunity cost, which as a, from a company standpoint, we are now getting so creative on how do we drive that attention to that area using technology, using modern approaches. And the good thing about the US and what's exciting is you don't have to do that because people know where it is. And Perfect Bar did the work for that. But I think 
as we're going to start to see a huge future here in Canada where they're going to create the set. They're going to create refrigerated snacking because the consumer is who wants it badly. They want it badly. They just need to figure out how to use their supply chain properly. Canada is almost as if we've been training. You know, there's that movement right now, go run with weights around your ankles. Because then when you take off the weights, it's like easier. So Canada was like training with weights on the ankles. And now we're in, you know, we're in our uh, U.S. expansion. It's like, like, this is incredible. What are you talking about? We're, we're being welcomed with open arms. Yeah, Nick, I, I can hear the exasperation in your voice, especially talking about produce. And I imagine people listening on our show are like, preach, preach. Don't these buyers understand the opportunity? <laughs> Um, you know, fresh is a big reason why people buy certain products today. Um, I wonder in the, in the pecking order of why people buy your products, uh, what, the, what the pecking order looks like. Is it fresh? Is it protein? Is it snackability? Um, what is the most important reason that people buy your products? Is it brand? I, I guess in, given that you do have such direct communication with your customers, I imagine that you do have a good sense of what that uh, hierarchy looks like. I'm going to say something that's going to blow people's mind away right now is that the number one keyword. So if you go and Google midday squares review, I think we've got like about 1500 reviews that we mine data on all the time of what are the keywords people are using to describe the number one keyword that's used is the word actually midday squares actually works. It actually solves my cravings. It actually does what they, I believe that our counterparts in the industry, not startups more so, and I won't name names in the bigger end, but have set the bar so low in terms of their promise to consumers and not fulfilling that promise, that the fact that we have built an amazing tasting product that actually fulfills the promises we make is what's allowing this explosion to happen. And that's why I believe the word actually is the number one term you use in all of our reviews. And then to sell the product, not just that, is they go into the store, again, it's feeling that they're buying from humans, um, comes from brand. They feel like they're buying from the humans. So we set ourselves apart from the 35,000 SKUs in the grocery store. You know, because if you look at a fridge, it's very mind boggling. Your eyes go everywhere. There's so many colors, there's so many this. But if they feel like they're buying from that human, alongside the mind boggling that Nick just said of the actually doing what it says it does and does more, you win because you use both the product market fit that we discussed and the brand, and they end up creating that explosion in the consumer's mind. In the product development that we did, people always ask, what did you take so long? What did, why did you take a year with McGill University to produce this product and, and work on it? We didn't go to McGill more so for like the, 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 the flavor and the, and, the, and the amazingness of the taste. We went there for the function. And we wanted to put out a snack that would actually kill your hunger for up to four hours. And we're, and we're actually actively working on getting the official claim on that. And so what we spent all of our time with McGill University was concocting a recipe that balanced fats, fibers, and proteins. One of the number one things that's missed in the protein market is if you go look at proteins that exist in nature, whether it's in plants or meats, they always come with fibers and fats. What we do in post-processing is we strip the entirety of that and we just put out isolated proteins. So that's why if you have a protein shake in 45 minutes, you're usually your hunger is, is back. And so the idea for us in being functional chocolate is not protein is, we're not trying to be a protein bar company, but protein is actively what we need part of our ingredient deck with fiber and fats to allow you to have a snack that holds you over to dinner. And that's what we spent a year with McGill University doing, was figuring out and testing the perfect amount of ratios to get that done. And so, Ray, your answer to your question is people buy our product because it's a, you know it, it, it tastes amazing. It does what we say it's going to do, and we deliver on our promise. Actually. Actually. This has been such an amazing conversation because I think a lot of people in our industry have heard about midday squares and they've seen the LinkedIn posts and they've seen the Instagram posts, they've seen the TikTok videos. And I think the, on the surface, the outside perception of you guys is that you're these three millennials on this wild ride, but clearly everything you do has a purpose. Clearly everything you do has, is part of a plan. And I wonder how much of that is from 
experience as former entrepreneurs in other businesses, or if there are certain influences, other entrepreneurs, other brands that have put you on this path of, hey, you know, we've got this outside uh, extroverted character driven story. And then we've got, as we talked about at at the top of the show, at the top of this interview, you know, really hardcore business fundamentals that um, are driving growth? I think uh, one thing I do also want to say that we haven't touched about is we, we manufacture our product. We've built a manufacturing plant as well to, to go on to that. It's a mixture of all of that, man. It's like I could I know personally what's driven me in different areas. I think Les and Jay could speak about it. Uh, I'm, I've am i been trained in ops. After my dad died, there was this man, Rory Olson, who took me in, uh, in his life, who was a revered finance M&A uh, machine out of Montreal, took this company, Paysafe, which a lot of people in the market, he founded Paysafe. It was originally called Surefire, took that public. Um, and I spent 13 to basically 21 studying under him and learning the ropes of how to scale businesses, M&A, what finance means to that growth. And um, I feel privileged, you know, and then my brother gave me a shot in a software company that allowed me to have another crazy experience. So I'm privileged in the sense that I got to see a lot of shit um, happen. And I was able to bring those together with my teammates that have like entirely different experiences um, and buy into, buy into this, this creativity of working on first principles. I think one thing you'll hear at midday squares and people probably get exhausted on our team is saying is reason up for, for from first principles, the playbook that we're trying to play in midday squares, it doesn't exist. We're, we're trying to create our own playbook and that's, uh, that's where I think the magic happens. So that's, that's my piece on, on why I think it's, it's come together in a unique way. I think from, a, from, like you said, core values, first principle thinking is definitely something. I think the three of us have old school grit, common commonality there. We, you know, how we could each stay in the pocket quite long, take the beatings, because um, a lot of beatings, Ray, as you know. Um, and then for me, I've personally grown through two things. Therapy, business therapy is one. So working on communication with my business therapist every week. Um, is one of the shout most out James popular. Gavin, Dr. James Dr. Gavin, yeah, always love giving him a shout he's, out. he's the three of our business therapists. So Dr. James Gavin, and then reading books, I read now 40 books in, in a year and a half. Um, and those 40 books have given me opportunity to get in the mind of many different leaders from different industries around the world and understand their thinking process and what they've gone through. And that relatability, that relatability that we talked about, I'm getting that relatability through that. And it gives me mass amounts of confidence. And I think that has allowed me to have, you know, I think Nick and I always discuss your mentors don't need to be physically there or on the phone with you or on FaceTime or Zoom. They could be through your readings or what you learn from certain things or watch. So you don't have to be physically connected to them. So I think that's made me personally grow and, you know, within the business. And I think that pays a huge dividend to how we, I function within my part of the puzzle. Uh, I was just going to hop in on, one, on that and just say, uh, Jake, you, you really stole the words out of my mouth, which was um, business coach therapy um, has really allowed me to challenge myself um, on very, very hard subjects. Uh, Jake and Nick challenge me every day. Um, and so I think the tripod pushing each other and, and you know, having this thing that we all bring from different uh, walks of life. I think that has the, the, you know, our backgrounds and our life experiences and everything that's led us to midday squares helps us make decisions. Um, and like Nick said, first principle thinking is a big, big thing that we, we, we believe in here. And, and so we reason up from first principles when it comes to everything. Like Nick said, we manufacture most experts and people that were in the industry for 30 years plus told me I wasn't going to be able to build this plant for number one, the amount of money that we had budgeted, number two, and the amount of time um, we had to do it, and three, almost impossible to make our product at scale um, without, like like I said, years of R&D and a serious investment. And I built the plant in less than a year and a half for the budget that, you know, we, we, we budgeted for. And I think I went over a little bit, but 
I reasoned up from first principle thinking. I was, and I know this is going to sound really extreme. And I do say this here at Midday Squares, but if man can walk on moon, we could figure out how to scale a square. And so I think at the end of the day, if you keep that mindset and you question the status quo and you ask why a bunch of times, there is a bottom line and, and it's, 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 you know, knowledge is amazing, but we're also receiving new information all the time. And so sometimes years of knowledge or people that have extreme expertise or whatever have been in industry for a very long time, doesn't mean they have the newest, most advanced, most, you know, um, relevant information. So I think reasoning up from first principle, first principles, finding the right mentors and doing your research is really important to making good decision-making. If expertise was everything, then NASA would be SpaceX. I mean, that's that's hmm. just the truth of the situation. I like that, Nick. That's true. Um, oftentimes there are similarities, though, in successful companies and things you can look back upon and say, Okay, the as you pointed out, Nick, uh, you know, in terms of mul market multiples and tribalism, I mean, there's certain uh, commonalities and patterns that you see among successful companies. There's also commonalities that you see in failed companies, you know, what people did wrong. And I think back to Leslie, what you were talking about in terms of 10 years to get to 10 years of, of you know, being an entrepreneur and, 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 and working essentially on failed businesses to get to midday squares. Uh, I think Nick told me that uh, you tried to start a hotel when you were 19. Is that right? I so, was actually 15. Yeah. I was 15, okay. Yeah. <laughs> definitely non-traditional. Definitely something that people would look at and say, okay, there's no 15 year old in history or possibly ever. It wasn't a pipe dream, right? Like she did it. She hired an artist. Like it wasn't like, oh, I want to go build a hotel. There was architectural plans. There was blueprints. There was like, it was, it happened. You know what it is, Ray? My entire life, people were telling me that I was crazy um, and I was just a dreamer. Um, and I hated that statement. I was a dreamer, but a dreamer that knew how to execute. You are a dreamer. You're not, you know. You I am a dreamer, but are, like Jake are. said, grit and execution is, is the beauty to bring any idea or dream to actually life. And cross-pollination. <sighs> Absolutely. Uh, the, the interesting thing about a hotel, and this is this is crazy that uh, I don't mean to use the word crazy, but it's nuts to think about that you had these. Okay, crazy and nuts are the same thing. So I'll just call it what it is. We don't judge <laughs> we, on the words used. Right? You're good here. Judge I'm, supposed, flow, I'm supposed to be flow. better than that. <laughs> But when you have architectural plans, when you already know what the hotel is going to look like and, you know, from a from a architectural standpoint, that's that's amazing. You know, were you able to translate any of that, you know, learn from that experience and say, OK, well, I know this. This is going to help me build a manufacturing plant. Or was that a completely different experience? Were you able to draw upon these ideas that someone someone might have said, no, they're crazy. But, hey, in, you know, in the long run, they actually helped me. In a way, everything I've done in my past has helped me, like I said, to get here. You know, I started with, you know, you know, the technicalities of building a hotel and what that would look like to literally sleeping in manufacturing plants uh, in New York and Hong Kong when I was designing my clothing line. And so and even my 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 father has been in manufacturing, my grandfather. So I've been around it my entire life. And I just think, yeah, you know, I, I think. I don't know. It's this, it's this thing that kind of everything that I've done in my life in some crazy way has helped me um, with midday squares. I don't think any, anything you do is ever uh, a loss. I think if you, if you're a sponge, you're something to take away from every situation. There really is. And watching you, Les, navigate building our plant, it was pretty obvious that your comfort level in manu, you understood fundamentally how manufacturing worked. And that's where the first, get your hands dirty. Yeah. And, and it was like, it was so obvious when you were approaching and that's where the first principles came from is whether you're manufacturing clothing or food, the concepts are still the same. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, manufacturing is a, a big dirty process. I've definitely been to uh, food and beverage production facilities and my goodness, the people who do it right live it. I mean, they are completely saturated in the business of manufacturing operations and production. It's not easy, but if you can do it, um, it's a pretty remarkable gift. Now, as you guys continue to scale, it seems like Midday Squares has this opportunity to grow into something that not a lot of small businesses grow into, and that is 
uh, a company that can stand on its own, that doesn't need to be acquired, that doesn't need that big strategic exit. In fact, I think I read an article recently where I don't know if it was you or the author referred to Midday Squares as building the next uh, Hershey. I'm building a modern day Hershey company. That being said, it seems like given your success to this point, uh, you could have sold the company. You you could have exited. Um, but why haven't you? No, so we, I, I will say that we have had a, a very serious offer on the company. I won't mention from who, but it, it we it was like instantaneous. Like we all looked at each other and were just like, no, this is this is not what we wanted to do. When we pitched our investors in both Series A and B, we we were very very straightforward that an that a, a return on investment from this company will look at either a public offering or us uh, bringing on either new investors to take out older investors or loading on you know debt to buy out uh, our investors. But it, the, the probability of us selling to a larger company was was just something that we didn't want to build. And in your life, I think you have this pivot. I, I can only speak for me. Is I've come to the realization that my goal in life is to be stimulated and stimulated is a state of flow and enjoyment. And I want to do that until the day I'm no longer on this planet. And when you're building something as big as, you know, the Hershey's and the Mondelez is, uh, there's a certain motivation that when that scope is always in front of you, that stimulation that you have in your brain is addictive. And so that's, that's what, that's what the game is. You know, that's what we're playing for is we're just, Midday Squares has this product line right now, and it's very, very obvious how we scale it to us. Not, not easy, but it's obvious. And so why would we be distracted from anything else? That, and, you know, that, that's how I really feel about that. I got to tell you, it's a curiosity for me. Um, you know, our peers in the space, there's some phenomenal brands that have created amazing products that have gone from small, medium to large corp, and then, you know, swamped under the, the, the conglomerates have purchased them um, under their parent company. For me, you know, Kind was the last one that almost made it to see how they would go afterwards. But then Mars purchased them for, I don't know, a couple billion dollars. For five me, billion. Five billion. Wow. So yeah. for me, I'm curious personally to see, can we go past that and see what it looks like to have a modern day conglomerate with their flag right next to Hershey's? And I'm not saying take down Hershey's, General Mills, none of those companies, they've done a great job. They've created legacy brands, phenomenal job. You know, shout out to them, their inspirations. But I want to put our flag right next to them at the top where we become the acquirer and we build that, that, that level of magnitude, but not in 100 years. I think we could do it in five to 10 years. And as long as we stay true to what we've discussed this whole show, I think we have a fair chance of doing it and people will call us crazy. Um, but that's what makes it fun. And, and I, I think that I think we're all driven by the same hypothesis. What happens if you give three wackos like us the cash <laughs> flows and revenues of a company like Hershey's? What happens? Like, what happens if we have access to that? Um, how crazy does it become? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I'm curious. I want to know more. Uh, I wonder what your investors think of that. Well, if you ever, if you ever want, Ray, uh, I know two of our investors that would go on the record to have that talk with me because they, there has been those moments where you guys are completely out of your minds. <laughs> well, how do you find investors that realize that you guys are out of your minds, but in a good way and believe in you to take this company to the level that you want to take it to, you know, without worrying about a short-term return on investment? I feel, Ray, at the end of the day, they're, they believe in us as entrepreneurs. So as wacky and as crazy as we are behind all of, you know, the media, the content, the craziness, the wackiness, at, at the core, they believe in us and they just need to have a piece of the pie and they believe in what we're doing. So they're like, look, this is going to work huge or this is not going to work at all. But, but more importantly, though, Tut, that is the truth. But we have yeah. three years of track records now. Yeah. So oh, you yes. have to remember, in a Series A, investors came and this manufacturing plant and revenue projections were a pipe dream. We then presented something. And when we present, we're thorough and serious, right? The craziness comes from the concepts, but the representation of what we want to do is very clear and very, you know, always we do it in less than 10 slides. 
And so you have a bunch of three crazy kids show up in your office and say, hey, we're manufacturing chocolate out of our condo. We're going to build a manufacturing plant that does 90,000 bars a day. And at the same time, we're going to grow revenues at these speeds. And you're like, okay, you know, and, and you make that bet. And then a year goes by and everything they told you they were going to do, they did and more. And then a series B comes along and you're like, well, hey, now we're going to go do this. And by the way, we're going to grow revenues at this way. And our gross margin is going to look like this in uh, eight months. And uh, this is the reason why, because we're going to renegotiate these. And, and then a year, another year goes by and guess what you've done people start to believe because you're giving them all the reason to believe. And so I believe what Jake, Les, and I are the most proud of is that we have three years of track records now of promising and delivering. Yeah, credibility. Credibility is, is huge. You know, investors I've spoken with too, like love passion. They always say we're investing in the entrepreneur. We're investing in the person. And this might sound like a little bit of a strange question, but how, how does love come into the equation? I used to think a long time ago that love is just natural and that if you love something, you're just going to love it unconditionally. But then I, I started to learn that certain things that you love are learned. You learn to love, you learn to appreciate things and you learn to embrace whatever it is that, that you're, that you love. Um, so you know, it, to make a long story short, how does love work for Midday Squares? How does it work for you guys as, as a team? Jake, you got to start this so, one because you... Well, the, re the reason why I got to start this is for two reasons. First of all, I'm a candy man at heart and I never loved chocolate. And I like to use the word love because I didn't. I've learned to love that. That's, that's simple. But the more complex thing is that, um, you know, love to me is at the end of the day, what drives this whole business, it, it literally drives a business. I don't look at love for necessarily, you know, trying a product. I've never tried two of our products because I'm deadly. I'm anaphylactic to nuts and peanuts. And I sell the product with love. I sell this product every single day with love. And that's because I love trust. And I enjoy coming here every single day, seeing the people I get to do it with, not just Leslie and Nick, but the 42 other people that's love because at the end of the day if you could go on the roller coaster and scream and go ah that's love not if you go on the roller coaster and you're complaining to the person next to you oh my god this that i don't even want to be here that would mean that we have no love but love is it i know it's gonna sound so cheesy it's gonna sound so weird right now love is in the air here at midday squares and it's contagious and we protect that culture of love so strong that our hiring process is so difficult because if we can't protect that, the love will fade. It could get pulled really, really quickly. If you have one hole in the balloon, boom, it empties out. The helium empties out like crazy. So I think that love to me is all those things of making sure that the culture and the environment is something fun. I love that, Jake. And I agree. Love is in the air for sure. Um, and I, I'll go back to business coach therapy. Um, I love what I do every single day, Ray. I do, but it is fucking hard. And part of the, the, the work that we put in every week when we go into therapy is about enjoying the process. Um, and, and not worry about any destination. And more than ever, I'm learning to live in the now um, more than the future, because what we're doing is so treacherous that you need to find that love of why you started every single day when you go to work. The love is why when you, when it was in our condo with Jake, Nick and I, you know, with, with my, you know, the, the, some of the women that started with me in the manufacturing, we were, we were grinding and dancing to Jamaican music and making the bars, right? That was fun when we first started. Now it's, it's a business with, you know, um, we have investments and we have payrolls and we're supporting people's families and we show up every day and, and people love our snacks. So it's, it's, you got to remember why you started and you got to figure out how to live in the now and enjoy the, the, the everyday. And I think going to culture and the love in the air is the, is in the air and the, that there's no destination is, is stuff that we work on every single week in the therapy. And I think that that has helped me so much in loving the process, even when it's really treacherous. Um, I go to sleep at night and I still say, I love what I do, even on the craziest days. Um, so I think, yeah, I think it's a lot of work and a lot of like being 
you know, um, working on yourself and working on the environment and, and having hard conversations. That's what keeps the love, really. They stole the words. I have nothing to add. I mean, that's, that's it. Well, I love that you have a business therapist and that you guys are, you know, expressing how important that is to your business. I think that's something that needs to be uh, expressed across the rest of the industry, communicated to the rest of the industry, because I think sometimes uh, people will say, as entrepreneurs, you, you need to have thick skin. Okay, you need to have thick skin, but you also need to talk about how that thick skin is developed and, and you know, to build your business, it's not just, uh, it's not, it's not just the roll with the punches. It's, let's try to avoid the punches from time to time. And I, and I think you guys are talking about that. And everything that we've talked about in our conversation really expresses that in a, in a, in a beautiful way. What would, for me, would be the most successful part of this journey. Um, and like you were saying is how do you develop that thick skin is, is, is making sure by the end of it, we are still who we were when we started this thing. And that's the hard work that you got to put in every day, you know, to remain the 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 soft, empathetic, good vibes people that we are, um, no matter how hard the, the the skin needs to be, you know. So that's a great point, uh, and this has been <laughs> such a great conversation. I've loved literally every second of it. Uh, I highly recommend to folks listening if you haven't been to Midday Squares website, Instagram page, check it out. And if you haven't tried Midday Squares, you have a pretty awesome opportunity to do so now on your website. Nick, uh, it's, it's been updated recently, yes? Yes, absolutely. It is basically we give a discount code to all first-time customers. So be sure to use it. Ray, I need to plug our podcast as well, too. If you, have, if you love this podcast, <laughs> you got to go and listen to Midday Squares Uncensored. We distill every single thing that we're going through while building the business. Here, here. And people say, do people still say here, here? All right. In any case, uh, Leslie, Nick, Jake, uh, just an honor to speak with you guys. Um, We've got to meet in person in Montreal, as we were talking about before uh, we started recording. Uh, I will happily have you guys uh, in Boston. Would love to have you visit the office. I know a few good places around here, too. So we'll go on a culinary experience, a culinary experience of two cities. And during the day, if we need a snack, well, I assume we'll uh, have plenty to chew on. And I do want to say, man, we have uh, what's most exciting about this relationship is uh, I think we're going to get to know each other over a long career. So I'm excited for that. I am very excited for that as well. And thank you once again for sharing uh, your journey with us. And uh, yeah, let's keep it going. Thank you so much, Ray. It was awesome. Have a good one. You too. 